Hey, thanks for joining me. Went digging through my storage shed, digging through all my tons of boxes I had out there and found a whole bunch of stuff I was looking for. And uh, forgot that I even had this thing. This was one of my favorite magazines back in the day when it came out. This was one of kind of the few places where you could get all kinds of really good information about the comic scene, obviously, ironically. Um, I think Wizard Magazine was going at this point, but I, I don't think it had yet become the monstrosity that it was going to because it's if as I kind of understand it wizard kind of started and was struggling just a bit it wasn't until image comics started and then they jumped onto the image comics bandwagon and rode that to crazy success and um this is it's hard for people to kind of understand what young blood meant to the many people at the time the excitement of it this was just at the beginning of the speculator bubble and comics were selling in outrageous numbers and liefeld was the man he was one of the biggest new names that connected with a young audience and it's you know even weird for me to say that because if you watch my channel you know how i have many criticisms of his art, but his older stuff, even this, I, I, there's something about it that I like, even if it's, you can find technical things wrong with it. I like his older stuff and, um, there's no denying, there's absolutely no denying his popularity at the time. So seeing this on the shelf, having been reading X-Force and the crazy huge popularity that book had. And then he's got a new team of what? Of uh, Holy shit, we've got to get this. We've got to get this. I have to pick this up. So $4.50 back in, uh, I think it's 91. Um, sorry, I should have looked at this to start. Why doesn't it tell me right there? 91. So, but the great thing about this magazine, this poor magazine, if you can tell, it's seen some, I don't know, maybe a little bit of slight water damage. That's what happens when it sits out in the shed for years. Um, seen better days. But it had all kinds of neat shit in here. So if you're lucky enough to see something on the cover that you really love, you pick it up and you're most likely to find all kinds of stuff inside it that um, you might really enjoy on its own, you know, see something new. So, God, I feel like there's another page turn here. <clears throat> Excuse me. It starts out with a great picture of Spider-Man by Eric Larson, Ghost Rider, and the boring-ass Shadow Man. I do not understand that character. But anyway, these magazines were great fun. All kinds of information, letters, pages, comic strips, and things that are supposed to be funny. Sometimes they were, sometimes they're not. And then, again, like, you know, these days we're spoiled. You just pull up YouTube on your phone and you look, you know, you look up instrumental score to Star Trek 2 and you can listen to it. But at the time, if you wanted something like this, you had to go find it on cassette tape or CD and you had to order it from somewhere or drive to a, like a, a music shop and see if they had it. I was, was and am am really big into star trek specifically the older stuff the newer stuff kind of bores me to tears but and i also love instrumental scores and in music and so getting cds of star trek 2 and 3 was one of my first musical kind of like so i started noticing what music was in movies from star trek movies I mean, it was always there, but at some point, for some reason, in these two movies specifically, I started like going, wow, does this music, does the instrumental score just drive the feeling of this thing? Like, it's so important. I would listen to this on my own. And I started collecting movie soundtracks like crazy for a long time until it got to a point that they all kind of started to feel like they were just repeating themselves. But this is where you'd find stuff like that. <clears throat> um, an article on Luke Cage never was anything I was particularly interested in, especially at this time. Oh my gosh, excuse me, it's late. Um, <clears throat> but it's always interesting to see the stuff that's um, being created artwork in almost a black and white form and it's interesting looking back on it retrospectively now just to kind of see what was being pushed as something big and exciting at the time i don't know if this was actually really successful but they were trying right um 
always was really fascinated by this article in a lot of ways just because of the artwork. This image over here, this one, I stared at this forever trying to understand how so few lines and a couple of dark blobs for those eyes could make like one of the coolest flaming skulls I've ever seen in my life. Like there's almost no definition of like the mouth and the slots in between the skull, like the, 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 the openings in the jaw line from the upper and lower jaw and just those scratchy little crosshatch marks and no outer, outer line. It's so perfect. It feels like a rough kind of sketch says uh, art by Tex and inks by Palmiotti, which is interesting because Tex's work always looks best when he goes crazy on it. But I wonder, it would be neat to see what the pencils look like that. So I got to give it to Palmiotti for inking that. But I loved that. I've always thought that was so interesting. And then this wash, I mean, Tex paints for sure. So... I don't know if that's a wash or oil paints or whatever, or who knows, but it's just great artwork. But it's just an article with, you know, interviewing the artist, talking about his artistic influences and, and what he's doing on the book. He does say a thing here, um, is it, or is it on the other page? It was an interesting... He says, Marvel can't figure out his popularity, the Ghost Rider. Um, he says they can't figure out why it's selling because they're not advertising them like X-Men and Spider-Man. So it's interesting that are like they just had kind of like a surprise, unexpected, unprecedented success on their hands. They're like, well, for some reason, this is working and it's selling really well and Marvel's not really pushing it. So, yes, you just grab onto it and just run as, as quick as you can. And they did. Ghost Rider by Tex is by far the best, in my opinion. It just was like... The combination of the best kind of artist on the right kind of title with the right kind of character design. Tex has this artistic style that I've talked about before that's just this dark and scary and horror-based kind of look that, um, I mean, I can't imagine a bright and happy superhero being drawn by Tex and looking quite as perfect as it does like a dark horror character. So... It's really interesting. I mean, it's I love getting the opportunity to see Texas artwork in black and white. These look really cool. That skull is just fantastic. Just absolutely beautiful. Um, he also talks about, and I thought this was another thing that was interesting, that Tex looked at Todd McFarlane's version of Ghost Rider when Ghost Rider guest starred in the Spider-Man book. And Tex says he looked at that version and saw how Todd McFarlane enhanced the flaming look like, obviously, you're always drawing Ghost Rider with the flaming skull, right? Like, that's easy. That's fine. But McFarlane made those flames trail all over the place and used it like a designing element, like Todd McFarlane does. If you look at his Spider-Man, those webs are everywhere. If you look at Spawn, the capes and the chains are being used as design elements all over the place. So you have to look at what you got with the character and what can you do to really make it stand out and be different and McFarlane being who he is just takes those flames and they're just whipping all over the place and Tex says that he saw that and wanted to like enhance that and I, I don't know if this is intentional on their part but there's a picture here of Ghost Rider with just a simple little flaming skull but then you look up here at this one and suddenly the flames and everything, I mean, it's a little bit more elaborate. I mean, these are flaming pumpkin, probably from the Hobgoblin, obviously. But just the flames get enhanced a little bit more. And it's, it's interesting to see Tex see that and be inspired and go, okay, there we go. All right, now I, now I just found a missing element. And it became really good. I thought Tex doing Ghost Rider was fantastic. And I got to review more of those books. <clears throat> so that'll come. That being said... Young Blood by Rob Liefeld. I have covered many a Rob Liefeld book, and I've had many things to say about it. In fact, so much that people are almost like, oh, good, thank God, another Liefeld episode on Rob's channel. We can't wait to hear him bash him. And, you know, sometimes I feel like I should just let it go. Some people, I, I occasionally get comments on my channel here on certain videos about how I can't or I shouldn't, and I'm petty, and I'm a loser, 
and I'm jealous because I'm bashing on Liefeld because look at all the success Liefeld's had. Well, yeah, sure, okay, that's fine. But you can also look at an extreme amount of screw-ups, failures, and missteps in his career. And if you can't be objective about it, then whatever. That We're going to have a difference of opinion on that. He does get a lot of actual, like, people just, like, hate the man. I don't have a problem with the man for the most part. I try to keep my comments only on the shit that he puts out there for us to see. His art, his comics, his stories is public, publicly put out there for consumption and I can comment on it. Anybody can comment on it and tell what you really honestly think of it. That's what I try to do on my channel here. I'm here to talk honestly about what I think. Forgetting Everything we know about the future history of this character, the book, and everything that's about to come, looking at it at the time, only at, in this moment when this came out, there was nothing cooler in comics than this right here. What's interesting is this is pre-announcement of Image Comics. Now, I don't know where that division comes up, like how long after this is, is introduced and how later into it that Image Comics is formed. But at the creation of this right here, they never once mention in this article, Image Comics. It's being published by Malibu. And Liefeld is talking at length about he's going to keep working on X-Force. He's got long plans for it. He's not going anywhere. And that changes extremely quickly when Marvel realizes what uh, he's about to do and what all the rest of them decide to do. And they shit can them all. I mean, they didn't get shit canned, but I know Marvel was pissed. And, um, you know, they all left. But it's interesting, a little snapshot in history, because like I'm saying, there's no mention of Image Comics here at all. And um, Liefeld's talking about being on X-Force. So X-Force was going great. Everyone was super into it. It was selling like a motherfucker. And I, as a kid, I was super into it. Very much into what was going on. So Liefeld's going to continue X-Force, but he's also going to do his own book, this Young Blood. Oh my God, new characters. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. Like, somebody please tell me more about this. And that's what you get out of this. Now, I just kind of perused this article. And it's shocking the amount of shit that Liefeld is going over here about all these characters and their backstories and what is coming up in the books soon to be published that never, ever were explained or told or introduced in those books at all. You really get the idea that life will just is bursting with ideas, but when it comes to the execution of something new and fresh, he he didn't know what he was doing. Let's just be honest. The Youngblood miniseries that come out from a story perspective was an absolute train wreck. It was just a mess. Um, it's one thing to pick up New Mutants on issue 80 whatever or whatever it was that he was doing. Um, where he started, and you got something already going. You got established characters, situations, personalities, backstories that are built by Chris Claremont in the even way longer running X Men. You just kind of pick up the ball and just kind of keep going. But when you create a new book like Young Bud, you have to start from zero. Nothing has been established, nothing has been set up. You can kind of lean into the tropes of superheroes, and people be, tend to be familiar with that, but. You have to start from beginning, right? It's a whole different thing. And be, let's be honest. I think there's no denying. There's no denying. Even Liefeld himself says he fucked it up. He doesn't know how bad he's going to fuck it up, but he does. So he talks about what Youngblood is to him at this start, um, how he's had all kinds of ideas for it for a long time. And um, he continues talking about Let's see. There were several interesting parts. I thought about going through and highlighting important parts in this book, but I don't want to highlight up in my already ruined book, do I? This thing's clearly worth money. Um, again, he talks about how Youngblood evolved as a result of growing up in the MTG, in MTV generation music videos in your face all the time. Um, if superheroes were real, they'd be bigger than movie stars would be big time celebrities. All right, sure, that's 100% fair. Um, that wasn't really gotten into too much in the original Youngblood miniseries, a little bit. Um, let's see. Uh, I also liked seeing the black and white artwork. That was always fun, like I've been saying, as a guy who liked to draw comics, 
Um, at this point, I was barely learning how to draw. And just to see this stuff in black and white, and Liefeld stuff is so non-traditional from like an inking standpoint. It kind of flies in the face of like traditional understanding of comic inking, but it works, you know? I mean, it, it basically works. So this is where there's some interesting bits here. It says, in addition to offering a flip flip cover, every issue features a 12-page story for each team, with both groups intertwining more closely by the third issue. Liefeld fans will be disappointed to learn, however, that the third issue is also the series last. Well, most of that is incorrect. Issue one had flip covers for away team, home team. And yes, they were you know, two different teams doing two different stories. Yes, but that was the only issue, issue one. And then it says it's a three-issue series. That's not true. It was a four-issue series. And then it still didn't even finish its own storyline. They had to finish it in issue four of Brigade as a backup issue drawn by somebody else. I've gone over this at length. It's just interesting to see how Liefeld's saying, this is what it's going to be. And it didn't turn out to be that at all. Now, it, I mean... Things are fluid. You have an idea in your head of what you're going to do, and then things change, and it grows. And I, So I don't care about that. I'm not really saying that as a criticism. It's just an observation of what he's saying. It's this, but that it turned out to not be that at all. Um, he says, the, however, the third issue will also be the last. It, it's all I could fit in right now, but I wanted to get this out here. They're, they're, they are characters that I like a lot, and there are themes in it that haven't necessarily been explored. Um... Let's see. He does refer reference, um, he's like, for example, there's Masada, who is Israel's first and only hero to date. So, you know, that character didn't show up for a while, but he's had that character in his head for a long time. So that's interesting. Um, th this is another interesting part, because if we all know the Youngblood universe, it's Youngblood, it's Brigade, it's... Um, the fuck was the book that, um, oh my God, the other one, was it Blood Strike? Oh my God, I just can't think of it. It Anyway, y'all know what I'm talking about, the Dan Fraga drew. But he says, but he talks about introducing the numbskulls, a group of guys who are literally the rejects of all the genetic engineering that's going on. They didn't quite turn out the way they were supposed to. This is crazy, but this is how I get my ideas. My dad had a brain tumor when I was in sixth grade, and it reoccurred twice since then. Thank God he's lived through each one. But when I was a kid, I, I remembered that the entire half of his face was numb, and he was never he never had feeling in that in that side since. Um, so he's like, well, what if there was a whole bunch of these guys, you know, they had weird things like that happen, and it screwed up them genetically. So. The numb skulls are nothing that ever were created. I don't know. I, I'm trying to imagine what that would have been spun into instead of. I mean, there is that team of oh God. Is it? Is it Bloodstrike? I'm so mad. I can't think of it. I don't know where one of those issues is. I know Bloodstrike is the name of a character, but um, like dead soldiers reanimated. Um. I know you'll tell me, one of you, in the comments and bring it up. But numbskulls, he brings up. A bunch of characters of genetic rejects. That's another thing that ever come up. And then he goes in to talk about all the characters. Now, this was interesting because he goes on and on for paragraphs about all the characters in their individual ways of or individual character characteristics. And he mentions all kinds of stuff about them that sounds like reasonably interesting-ish character traits N almost none of which were in the fucking books i i know over in the cartoonist kayfabe channel um they talked about this all the time often especially specifically with young blood where they're like you'd hear about all these backstories of these characters in the interviews for, of the creators talking about the book never in the book itself Super correct, right here, right here. This is maybe the origin of that type of stuff. He talks about a character named Sci-Fire, and he's a triple kinetic, a pyrokinetic, a telepath, and a telekinetic. 
They put psychic dampeners on him, blah, blah, blah. He's this, he's that, he's this, he's that. Another member of the away team is Brahma. You remember talking about um, his wife is one of three girls. They're all triplets. And they talk about how a human embryo separates into three separate ones. And that's where you get twins or triplets or whatever. So life felt like, well, what if that, that thing was going to happen, but all three stayed as one and just produced a giant human being? He says that uh, he killed his mom during childbirth. He says that Brahma, his name is Jeff. He's from a really dysfunctional family. His brother suffers from muscular dystrophy. His father blames him for his mother's death. He excels at football. The NFL pursues him. Um, I'm gonna, but then he's like, um, the government comes after him. So he decides to go with the Young Blood program. Like none of that was in the miniseries. I guess it doesn't need to be, but when you think about the amount of characterization, if for those of you who've read Youngblood, what was Brahma's character besides the big strong guy that punched Prophet once? Like there was none. Now I think they got into it in other comics by other other artists and uh, probably other writers, but you're getting all kinds of like, all right, there's kind of a backstory to the character that you don't ever find out in when he was introduced for a long time. <clears throat> um, reluctant to be on the team is Riptide. She can take any moisture that is in the air and create tidal waves or mass geysers. Um, she could draw the sweat off someone's brow or the dampness in a room and just accelerate it. It's a mystically based ability. I don't ever remember that coming up. It's like magic. Okay. She's a pretty powerful member of the group, but as for her personality, she's not really into the team. She's part of God. She's, in there because of a contract and she wants out of her contract and wants off the team. Didn't know any of that. The only character trait that I know about Riptide is that eventually she decided to pose nude for like a Playboy type ma magazine one time. And that's the extent of the characterization. Oh, and she got murdered once. That's her character trait. She got naked and she got murdered. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, there's Sentinel. He's actually the very first Youngblood member. Uh, I didn't know that. Uh, he's a scientist inventor. Didn't know any of that. Um, he created a bunch of exoskeletons and blah, blah, blah. And he sold them to the, the government. And great. He's like, he's the Mr. America. My uh, Mr. Fight for my country. He's the symbol of liberty among all these guys. We call him Mr. Youngblood. If the whole thing crumbles, he'll still be there because he believes in the project. I believe he's also the one who murdered Riptide. But Alan Moore did that because Alan Moore got hired by Liefeld. And he's like, oh, let me see what you got going on here with these young blood characters. And he goes and reads that shit. And I'm sure to himself, he's chanting magical, like, seances and shit. He's like, that young, young blood comic's a pile of shit. I've got to do something with it. I'm going to have the black man kill the naked woman. And uh, he wrote a good story. Um... Liefeld credits the 1982 film version of Cat People for creating Cougar. And he's like, they're like werewolves, but they're cat wolves. And I've got this long story about Cougar's mother was found unconscious by an expedition and taken into their care. And she mated with one of them. So she fucked a cat person. Okay. The result was Cougar. Cougar comes back and he he's going to join up with the team. Liefeld is quick to point out that Cougar is not another Wolverine. He acts more regal and royal than brutal and savage. No, he didn't. He did not act like that at all. He just acted like a smart mouth that jumped around and like punched at people. He doesn't have claws at all. Eventually, people gave him claws on his fingers. It was like, what can this guy do? Is he fast and he can punch? He has no weapons? I mean, it's an interesting-ish design, I guess, and for a new team. But what did he do? But, you know, life was very quickly to point out he's not this. Well, he, he was not that, but he wasn't anything else either. But he gives all this backdrop to the character. He was originally going to have him show up in New Mutants, but then that changed. And then he took Cougar out of the team and put Feral in there. Feral was supposed to be related to Cougar, but he changed Feral into a whole new character. Stuck in an X-Force, rest is history. Um, two more aliens serving the young blood cause are Combat and Photon. Um, but Liefeld will quickly pose the question as to which one is staying on the Earth illegally. You always hear about the government covering up alien discoveries. Well, here they are. They're basically warring aliens, Cougar and Photon. I'm sorry, Cougar. Photon and Combat. 
that are two opposing alien races that absolutely hate each other. And so, but they crash on Earth and then they split them up and put one on each team in, in exchange for exchange for alien technology. They'll give them asylum. Okay, great. Uh, not much character there. I guess combat's supposed to be a wanted man. Um, Youngblood, the team's led by Shaft, an excellent marksman and skilled martial artist, just like another bow-carrying character in a Liefeld comic book. Um, but I guess he's really, he's on the FBI, he was really good at what he does, and the government's like, hey, you're awesome, put on some spandex and shoot arrows and aliens and shit. And the guy's like, alright, that's fine. Uh, Reed is also find out more about, uh, let's see, Battlestone. Yeah, um, the previous guy who held the leadership position in Youngblood was a guy named Battlestone, was tired of the government's bullshit. He left and formed a group called Brigade. The government isn't very happy about that. We find out about that in the miniseries. Readers will have to find out more about Battlestone and Brigade in their own four-issue stint, which kicks off after Youngblood concludes. Um, he's like, I created the characters for that miniseries, and I'll be co-plotting it and inking it. Hank Canals will script the book, and Marat Michaels will be co-plotting and drawing it. Um... So, I mean, that's kind of what happened. Uh, I do have to say, I've always thought that these rough kind of standing character designs that Liefeld does are actually pretty fucking spectacular. I, I think that these just basic, like, scribbles of a character design, even these basic lines and shapes for this uh, ridiculous outfit on Bad Rock, um, are pretty good. I kind of wish a little bit, like, if you understand how big... Bad Rock is supposed to be, and we go back to the cover, he's huge. But when you saw this, I was kind of like, well, if they're all kind of standing on the same ground, he's actually shorter, but he's wider and thicker and made of rock. And that, to me, that's slightly more interesting. Kind of a shorter, like, I mean, if Prophet here is six foot tall, at least, maybe a little taller than, you know, Bad Rock's under six feet, but that's kind of interesting. But I don't know if he just if that was his intention or it's just he's just scaled down because they just put these together. Who knows, right? Who knows? Who cares? Um, getting into more characterization, you got Die Hard. Um, he is an ex-soldier type experiment. He's the government's government's first and foremost genetic experiment gone good. They gave him a serum, the drugs, the technology to be this ultimate soldier. He's incredibly strong and strong-willed. He has increased abilities all around. The closest thing to a Superman that the book has, Die Hard was the Superman. All right. Um, you'll see, uh, but the, he's the closest thing to a Superman that the book has, but there's also a mysteriousness to him. You'll see him take his mask off and stuff. No, he didn't. And we'll follow him home a couple of times. No, he didn't. But as to who and what he is, is going to be left up to the reader's imagination. I mean, eventually, we, I don't know if I've ever seen him actually with his mask off 100%. I remember there was like a scene in a Young Blood issue way, way later. We like took it off and he cut, catch just a little bit of the side of his head that's looked like ground up hamburger like Spawn. And we never followed him home. He was never home. There was no home. He just kind of comes out of a closet and flies into battle. And then we move on to Chapel. I don't want to give away too much about Chapel. He's the mysterious, dark, brooding character. <laughs> And that's basically all it says. All right. And then there's Vogue, a Russian agent who defected to the U.S. because she liked to hear better. She's also very dark and mysterious. The Russians want her back in a very bad way, and they'll put things in motion very early on to get her back. No, they didn't. None of this shit happened in the miniseries. Not one fucking bit of it. Liefeld just glommed onto the idea of profit starting with issue two, and basically made him the star of the book. You don't learn anything about him. You don't learn anything about the, all the other characters. It went from a three-issue miniseries to a four-issue miniseries, which still didn't finish, and like I said, had to be finished as a flipped book and on in Brigade Number 4, drawn by um, Chap Yap, which was just, just, just awful. Just terrible. Um, and then filing, filling out the team is bad, Bedrock. Yeah, right, obviously his name was Bedrock before he got sued by Hanna-Barbera or threatened to be sued and had to change it from Bedrock to Badrock. But basically, he, you know, he's a kid. His, get, his dad works for this terrible organization, Gates Genetic and Technological Engineering. And the kid is a loser nerd. And then he takes his 
serum, because that's how it works, drinks the serum, becomes giant monster guy. And this kid's a 16-year-old kid, and he loves it. He's a giant monster superhero, and now he's awesome. He never seemed to be a kid in the comics. He just seemed to be like a smart-ass young adult. The only time I ever read him where he felt like a kid is when Eric Larson had him in, I think, the third issue of the original Dragon miniseries. And Eric Larson wrote him to sound like a dumb fucking kid with a ridiculous amount of power. That's the only time that character was ever portrayed, in my opinion, the way he was described. Liefeld never wrote him in a way that made me feel like he was a kid. Whatever. What the fuck do I know? But then Liefeld goes on and talks about what did your the interview, you know. Do you do stuff for DC? Could you do stuff for Titans? And he's like, well, you know, I can't do everything. I have ideas, but whatever, whatever. So continue on page 66, back here. Liefeld, um, I don't think there was anything else that was um, worth mentioning. He's like, working with Malibu has gone much more smoothly for the Young Bloods creator. So again, he's just talking about, I'm going to publish this through Malibu. There's no mention of Image Comics yet. So it's really interesting. Um, and that, that's basically the end of it as far as the, the Liefeld Youngblood stuff. So as a kid reading all of this shit, I'm like, I can't wait to, wait to read these characters. If only we knew that how much of the reality would be such a letdown. But the interesting thing is, is getting all this backstory and you go and read the comic and it's not in the comic, but you still know it about the character. Because you've read the, from the creator what those backstories are. And so you're like, well, they didn't mention it, but I know. So it kind of filled it in. It's kind of a terrible way to make your comic characters uh, well known is by just describing their character traits in a magazine interview. But I guess it kind of works. So anyway, um, that's the end of that. So we move on to um, other characters and artists, which, I mean, the artwork's fine. But it's just not anything I've ever read and I don't know anything about. So I have no opinions to... Uh, talk about on any of this stuff it's dc stuff and i was just never into it now getting into this stuff this is way before i knew anything about the crow i'm trying to remember when did that movie come out i mean it was early 90s but i want to say this is before the movie um I'm, i feel like i'm sure it has to be but i didn't know anything about it but i remember just looking at this black and white grayscale art and I'm like god that's not a lot rob liefeld but I mean, obviously, but it's not that kind of style that is attracting my eye. But something about this felt like, huh, that's that's interesting. I never did see the book on the shelves every anywhere. Um, or if it was in the comic shops that I would get the rare occasion to go to. Because I, I was collecting comics in a small town in southern Utah. And the only place to get comics was like spinner racks at a local drugstore or like a, a convenience or like a convenience store. Sometimes they're in a 7-Eleven or this drugstore that I would be at, Bullock Drug, it's called in southern Utah, Cedar City. Um, and then eventually an actual official comic shop did open up that was riding the wave of the image kind of explosion. But they weren't keeping shit like this on the shelves that I ever saw. It wasn't until I moved back up to Salt Lake and had access to some other bigger permanent shops and you could find some stuff on the shelves and I saw it sitting there for once but I was still too dumb to want to pick it up but at the time I'm like all right well I don't really care about this crow character but upon retrospect this artwork that's pretty damn good stuff so it's just talking about you know, with James O'Barr and the character and the things that he wants to do and how he's producing the book. Again, I believe that this interview must have been done before the movie and before the tragedy of what happened in that movie. So it would have had to have come up. And I did a quick kind of glance over it. And um, I didn't see anything that I noticed that talked about the movie. Anyway, um, John Bolton. Um, this guy's artwork is... His paintings are some of the most trippy, weird-looking shit. I know there's, like, a big reflection on this. But this, like, ghostly goblin thing, like, jumping the forced perspective on it all. But he's kind of translucent. Like, you can see through him. So it's like it's a ghost. Creepy, disturbing, weird. His uh, Aliens character covers. Um, I can't talk much about John Bolton. I know not much about him, but some of the work that I have seen... He makes some really, like, disturbing imagery that sticks with you. 
I remember seeing paintings and images in books and magazines, and I didn't know who it was until a long time after. I'm like, oh, that was John Bolton. Um, I didn't know that at the time, but God, that art stuck with me. So he's great. Fantastic artist. <laughs> Speaking of fantastic artists doing awesome traditional superhero comic books, Eric Larson taking over Spider-Man after McFarlane leaves. Um, that's a mini series that, uh, or I mean, mini series, whatever. It's a, you know, was it a six issue or an eight issue run that Eric Larson did? One of the better things he's ever done. I mean, I think it's like his his statement on Spider Man. He gets the character, has him team up with some heroes, Ghost Rider, Hulk, fights all the villains, has a great basic superheroic storyline. Eric Larson knows what he's doing. He knows how to make superhero comics. He um, definitely, uh, an interesting thing that he mentioned in here that I thought was really good. Um, it, it stuck with me forever. Um, he uh, he had to take over Spider-Man after Todd McFarlane, which sold huge numbers. Second highest selling, third highest selling American comic book of all time. The McFarlane Spider-Man number one. It was Spider-Man and then X-Force came out and then... Um, X-Men by Jim Lee came out. So, and, um, but, uh, how do you take over after McFarlane? Um, let's see. He mentions here, he says, Todd said to me that I was in a losing position coming onto the book because I was damned if I do and damned if I don't. If I drew just like Todd, I would get all sorts of mail for being a clone. If I drew nothing like him, I would get hate mail because I had changed the book so much. So I remember reading that and kind of feeling bad for Larson. Like, well, so what do you do? And I think the only thing you can do is just try to make the best comic book that you can possibly conceive of. Just do the best work that you can, which he does. And... Um, he says, from the editor's point of view, I think I came in at a pretty decent time. People were expecting the book to plummet like a stone as soon as he left. So if the book started to sell better, it was I was a miracle worker. And if it sold worse, everyone expected it to sell worse anyway. And they would say it's due to McFarlane's popularity. And that's fine, too. I came on and the book sold better. So I think that that's interesting because obviously you're going to get that issue number one sold two or three million copies, but then everything kind of trails down, you know, in varying degrees. There's probably even if there was like a like a chart to kind of track those sales, like it starts out highest with number one, and then issue two still up there, but then issue three it just kind of keeps trailing off until you get to issue what was it nine or ten when by the time McFarlane left, and so then Larson takes over, but then the stale sales start going back up a little bit is what the implication is here. So I think credit to Eric Larson for making a fun, exciting comic book, picking up the reins of a very challenging job and just running with it. So good job for him. So he just kind of talks about the comic and what he was doing and how he just, uh, it's just his approach to everything. It's a pretty fun article. Always great artwork. Like seeing it in black and white. So just kind of, I mean, I'm, I don't have much to say about it. It's, it's, a, it's a good interview. It's just, I guess, nothing really worth getting into too much. But it's a good article. Eric Larson was a kind of a fun, exciting guy, and I liked him. And uh, that's why he went on to do the Savage Dragon, which is the best image comic anyone ever did in that, in that first run of uh, books. T2 realistic mask. I wonder what the actual mask looks like. Um, Ultraman, I have zero knowledge or interest in that, so I skipped it every time. Um, couldn't be less interested in a character named Shadow Man that likes to, that lives in New Orleans and likes to play the saxophone. That has a, his symbol is a picture of a man silhouetted in a door shape, like in a doorway. I just, I don't care. Never have, probably never will. And maybe that's a, that's a mistake on my part, but I couldn't imagine anything being less interesting to me as a kid, especially when it's got done looking at Larson's Spider-Man and Liefeld's Youngblood as a, to, to a kid. I was like 14 years old. 
could not care less. Um, I mean, shit, I was way more interested in, like, God, I want these Star Trek technical journals. Because, again, like I've mentioned, I love Star Trek and I love the technical aspects of it. The space vehicles and shit. And, like, diagrams and descriptions of what these ships can do. God, I'm so into that. Uh, Star Trek VI, great. Great final movie. Big Star Trek fan. Uh, the Crow interview is continued here. More great artwork. That shit looks so good. Uh, they talk about, uh, I guess, the lady who was the screenwriter for the Beauty and the Beast animated movie. Back in that kind of big surge of Disney animated stuff that was all just fantastic. Great, great movie. Still entertaining to this day. And... More magazines you can buy, continued interviews. You could buy a bunch of Star Trek pins. All right, I'll be honest. I have one of those. I didn't order it from here, but I do have one. I still got it sitting around here somewhere. I didn't want any of the others, but I'll take the pin. I'm kind of comfortable with that. Uh, Family Dog, um, written and directed by Brad Bird, who went on to be part of Pixar and do Incredibles and stuff like that. This animated show, Family Dog, at the time was the funniest thing I'd ever seen in my life. I just couldn't imagine anything being funnier than that ever. You know, you watch it uh, several times, and there's still funny parts. It's still, still very good, but it you know, kind of drops off a little bit in interest, but it's a pretty goddamn good show. Just creative, wild thing. Um, but it talks about um, how it was part of one of a handful of well-received episodes from Steven, Spielberg, Steven Spielberg's 1985 anthology series, Amazing Stories. That Amazing Stories, I thought was fantastic. There were several really well-done episodes that, I, that stuck with me in a big way. It's kind of like a Twilight Zone kind of thing in a way. Um, very good stuff. Uh, God, The Rocketeer. What a magical movie. It's just completely perfect. It's it's a shame that it bombed off its ass. But it's go, grown to... like People understand how good it is now. Anyway, just kind of the end of the stuff. Uh, great artwork from Sergeant Rock by um, Joe Kubert. And uh, just again, order some Star Trek magazines. Order some fantasy books. Good stuff. And then this ad, again, it's just Youngblood. Highest possible recommendation but it's not image comics not yet it's probably three seconds after this book was this magazine was printed that image comics was probably conceived of and introduced but at the moment when it was it was just Liefeld there was no Wildcats or Spawn that anybody knew of as far as I can tell there's nothing listed it's just Youngblood by Liefeld through Malibu, Com Malibu Comics it's not image comics yet but uh, boy that shit was about to explode so, anyway, comic scene number 25 from April of 91. Uh, good times. Great magazine. And um, this was super fun back in the day. You had to have been there to really experience how awesome this was. It, uh, it was everything to us kids. So, that's all I've got. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. And I'll see you next time.